alla sammen. Eh, så roligt att vara här. Eh, idag ska vi prata om min forskning om bilderna kommer upp. Please, nu får ni gärna sätta upp dem. Det blir jättebra. Får se. Alla väntar i anticipation. Jag tyckte det var jätteroligt att bild som jag såg förut. Eh, nu får vi teknikerna hjälpa till. Vi har allting på plats innan. Eh, vad jag skulle säga, jag tyckte det var jätteroligt för jag såg när jag kom in ett bild av en sån robot där borta. Förlåt. Oh, it's English. Oh, wow, it's English. That's even better. Woo Did anybody get that? That's Swedish? <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm so used to speaking in Swedish that I don't even... And I'm actually from the U.S., so hey. <laughs> Now I really got everybody confused. Okay, anyway, so I, uh, I actually moved to Sweden in 1992, and I've been here since then. I worked here to... Um, I moved here to work as a uh, consultant for McKinsey. Uh, and then after that, I started doing my PhD at the Stockholm School of Economics. So today we're going to talk a lot about my research, but also others' research. Um, and I think what's important here for me is that challenge basic assumptions. What basic assumptions have we had about business models, about industry, about jobs, about companies, about firms? Challenge them. Because that's what so many people are doing these days. If we talk about digitalization, it's so much more. There's actually a transformation that I believe is going underneath the surface. But it's about looking for those signals, signals from the periphery, challenging, saying, just because we've done it this way, doesn't mean we're going to continue doing it this way. Not necessarily. So there's one thing I want you to think about that, or when you leave this room today, is when you go walk back, walk back to your work, your organization, or wherever, walk in the door and behave as a tourist. Because what do tourists do? They question. Why do you do it this way? Why do you do it that way? If I did it this way, I could do it so much better or differently. So question when you go back, when you walk in and say, why do we sit the way we do? Why do we organize our teams the way we do? Why do we work with the clients we do? Act as a tourist and question, because I think that's where so many new ideas come from. It's about the questioning. And also another thing I think is important is asking what if. What happens if? I was reading an article uh, yesterday uh, at, the M at the MIT Sloan Management Review by Professor Gerald Kane. And one of the first things he puts up is like, you know, one of the keys to success for digitalization is longer thinking. And I've been talking about this for quite some time. In fact, my course that I teach at Handel's is scenario thinking. And with scenario thinking and scenario analysis, not necessarily the planning, et cetera, big, large scenario projects, but thinking about potential scenarios in the future. What might happen if? What might the world look like in 10 years? What might our industry look like in 10 years? What might customers look like in 10 years? And then taking a step back and saying, okay, how do we as a firm, as an organization, fit in to this potential scenario, this potential scenario, or this potential scenario? Do we have the resources, the competitive advantage to succeed in these different scenarios? Because many people, if you're taking just this short term, two to five years, it's very difficult to predict what might happen in the next 10. So those are like two things so far that I'd like you to take with you, because I try to think about what are kind of key takeaways, and those are some. First off, how many of you are on uh, SlideShare? If there's one, a few, okay. Uh, feel free, I put up all, all of my slides on SlideShare. Uh, it's a site on the internet uh, that you can find, it's an app. Uh, and I put all of my pictures, all of my presentations out there. My research actually, the, at the bottom, I look at how resources flow through informal networks. So how does knowledge flow, reputation, financial resources, trust, distrust, et cetera, loyalty, commitment, flow through informal networks. And so one of the key let's say, principles of networks, which I try also to like, get out, is steal with pride. No reason to reinvent the wheel. So if you see something here, feel free to take it and use it as you wish. So I'll put up this presentation and quite other, you'll actually see a lot of other presentations up there as well. So let's get started. Let's see, my computer is doing strange things. It's not the same. So I'll have to go from there. Anyway, how did I start? I actually started, uh, as I mentioned, I'm from the United States. So this is me in 1974. Uh, I'm not the pirate. I'm actually a computer robot going to space. So always been fascinated by technology. But to me, it's not just the technology. It's how we appropriate the tech. How do we actually use, incorporate, embed, integrate technology in our everyday lives? 
And I think maybe that's why I ended up on the front cover of uh, Vekin's Affair last year as Dr. Digital, because trying to understand also the bigger picture, not just this digitalization or digitization, how can we do things more efficiently with digital technologies, but how can we actually change, explore, develop new value creation activities, and what does that mean for society at whole? We're not just talking about firms, organizations, but actually how is value created in society? How are our societies organized? How do we work? How do we live, et cetera? So that's what we'll be talking about today. So a little bit of fundamental shift in strategy that we're seeing, some incumbent business models, what are firms that have been around for a long time actually doing, and a little bit about moving forward. So I put this up. I think this is a nice uh, quotation. I think a lot of this feel is that there's something about speed. Everybody talks about speed. Uh, but here's, you know, if the rate of change on the outside of an organization exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. Ah, what do you think? You believe it? Well, I, as a researcher, I have to say, is there anything behind this statement? And so looking at uh, what researchers, researchers and, and consultants have seen, if we even look to the year 2000, digital is the main reason that just over half the Fortune 500 companies have disappeared. But yet, digital disruption has only just begun. So this is one indicator. I keep on, you know, going further. Say, what more? What else is out there? It's a study by McKinsey. Uh, I believe this was discussed in the earlier session, talking about digital penetration in industries, and to what degree, how long, and how industries are quite different to the degree with which all products, services, etc., processes have been digitalized. And here you can see, on average, it's only around 37 percent. This McKinsey study, I think, was more interesting in that they were looking at what is happening with profits and returns. Because while we see companies disappearing and what's happening if we more we digitalize into the future, you're seeing these profits and returns being decreased. So think about it. So many more things we can do for free. We can't charge for these services. We have so many tasks that have been automated, etc. So here you're seeing, if we look into the future, extreme tremendous pressure actually on the profits moving down. I'm, so, I'm sorry, you guys can't see much, can you, with this in the way? That might be better, huh? Yeah. You, you should say, it's okay, say these things, because just like, you were speaking Swedish. Anyway, I just noticed it's very difficult for you to see. I'll put this over here. So anyway, so I see this as being, you know, one thing. But here comes our challenge. While we know that penetration is happening, we know that profits will be, you know, what's happening in the future. Some companies will do very well, others will do less well. This is a challenge for all managers and even individuals. If I know very little about what is happening, going to happen in the future, I don't even know what I don't know. It's very, it's like beyond my comprehension. How can you take those strategic decisions? For a student, which, which education should I enter? For a firm, which market should I enter? For, a, you know, a, a, or let's say a, a county organization, should we invest in this, an infrastructure kind of infrastructure, or some other kind? Where do we put our resources, our time, our energy? It becomes very difficult because we tend to look backwards. Well, this is what's been happening, but we have no idea. Very little. And this is why I said something in the beginning about scenario thinking. It's very difficult. We need to think in scenarios. What might happen if? So this is, a, this is our big challenge, right? And we say, yeah, we, we can probably figure this out. I'm sure many of you have seen this picture. But I show this because this has to do with actually understanding. It is very difficult to comprehend. This is 2005, right? The inauguration of the Pope. Very few telephones there. When did the smartphone come? Ten years ago. Today, we don't even think twice about having it in our pocket. Same event, right? And this is called diffusion of innovations. And what we're seeing is also network theory is the time that it takes for an innovation to spread through all types of individuals in society, it's being compressed. And that's primarily because we are becoming automation connectivity. So this is, you know, who would have predicted in 2005 it would have looked like this already? So this is another challenge, right? Bill Gates says we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. If we overestimate this change in the next two, but underestimate in the next 10, how do we, it's very difficult. That's why I also said, if we, if we take this two year, yeah, but what happens in the 10 year? It's very difficult. So be thinking, take this longer term thinking. 
So one of the reasons I think about this is in 2015, how many of you have one of these uh, now robots, smart robot? Any of you have one? I just uh, bought one uh, the other day, but unfortunately, uh, mine is called Sparky. Uh, but I couldn't bring it because it, uh, it has, its knee is hurt, so I had to send it back. But anyway, he actually told me. I was trying it on. I was trying was programming it and doing things with it. And he says, my knee is hurting. My knee is hurting. <laughs> so, oh, dear. <laughs> okay. So then I you know, got in touch, and I found, oh, I have to send him back. But I show this because... How many of you, I asked the question today, you know, a year ago I didn't have one. Again, diffusion of innovations. But here's Frederick, who was uh, you know, nominated as the, one of the, the, genius, Sweden, the genius of Sweden a couple years ago. And he's there. He has several of these robots. Elsa, David, Goliath, I think. And here he is with Goliath. I, I believe that was Goliath. It might have been David, but I don't think it was Elsa. But anyway, okay, this was at the Department of, or the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation, Nagsdepartement, here in Sweden, a couple years ago. And he walks in with his robot, and he started telling a story about how he commutes every day with this robot on the train. And when you are you know, taking a, a commuter train in Sweden, in Stockholm, you enter the train, you sit down, and then, uh, you know, sometimes the conductor comes in and says, tickets, please, comes up to Frederick and says, Frederick, can I, you know, have your ticket? Or I didn't say Frederick, you know, show me your ticket. Frederick shows the ticket, and so the conductor goes on. The robot, what does the robot do? The robot says, hey, don't you want to see my ticket? <laughs> this is a smart robot. It has been programmed to understand language, to interact, to, un to understand images, that a conductor wears a certain outfit, and that it should have some type of integration. Now, this is just one example, but the question is, wh or what I want, the reason I bring this out is this is a signal from the periphery. If we're talking about scenarios and scenario thinking, and thinking what might happen if, when, what, one thing one wants to do is look for signals, signals from the periphery. What is going on out there that might influence our industry, our customers, our employees, our society? Look for these signals. So this is one such signal that's saying perhaps we're going to a society where all, all we, you know, personal robots are everyday things. Well, I was giving this lecture with, um, for a group of uh, executives, and somebody from Volvo actually said, oh, you know what, yesterday, one of our suppliers called us up, and they said, hey, we really need to take a meeting, because we need to talk about starting to design buses with their own personal entrance for robots. So this is another signal, thinking, wow, what is happening? Are, where are we going? We don't know, do we? We have no idea what the future looks like in terms of robotization, automation. So, but the important thing is to be thinking what happens if. And i just show one more example before I move on. How many of you have stayed at one of these robot-driven hotels, a henna hotel? When I, I was in Japan a year ago and learned about this, it's completely run by robots. They have, I think it was seven employees. What do these seven employees do? They are in charge of all the cognitive non-routine tasks and the cognitive routine tasks. So in other words, things that are not, they, that's not the same thing over and over and over again. So they actually, they program the robots, they take care of the robots, and they change the sheets on the beds. Everything else is run by robots. Now a year ago when I was there, there was one, now there are two of these robots, and now they say there are plans for 100. This is a low-cost chain, a hotel chain. It's interesting to be thinking about. You know, they have plans to go global. So here they come, and it's the, th you know, all types of tasks have been um, automated, but those who have been automated are those that are routine, right? Those, we talk about routine and non-routine tasks. So is it something that you do over and over? It's the same thing, like you're always screwing on a screw or you're always checking someone in. Wait, so this is routine. We also talk about non-routine tasks, which are things that are different every time. It's a new context, a new solution. And so this is also, we also have that, whether it's you know, more of a brain type or a manual. So in this hotel, all routine tasks have been automated. And the only ones that are left are, you know, very few. So this gives an indication of what it might look like in the future. I just like this one too because this, uh, there's one thing that they're talking about is that you can actually talk with the chat bot and it will uh, you know, inter interact with you and you can find out what type of food you'd like and then it can be delivered to you uh, on the, through a drone that lands on the roof and drives a little car to your room and there you have your room service. Interesting to be thinking about. They're testing, breaking assumptions. And one other assumption, remember I started talking about breaking assumptions? 
Who said that you had to have a person when you check in? Maybe you can just check in with like facial recognition. That's one way. But also, why not a dinosaur? So actually, in their new hotels, they have dinosaurs as check-in people. Now think about this. What is one of, this is where you actually start talking about customer centricity, which is so important in this world, where you're breaking assumptions. about putting the customer in focus, right? In center. Thinking, what are the pains? What are the problems? How can we solve them with help with new technologies? So if you're thinking, like, I, I have five kids, I'm coming to the, to the hotel to check in. <laughs> My kids are running all over the place. I'm standing in line. Real pain for a customer, right? Well, hey, why, who said it had to be a person? Let's put a dinosaur there instead. And now my kid's like, wow, this is great. This is so cool. You know, circling around, wanting to go check in. So this is just one little, you know, minor, you know, way of breaking an assumption. But I think it's always question every little thing. Why do we do it this way? We have m lots of new tools at hand. But first start with the customer. Never start with the technology, right? A lot of people say, throw the technology at it and it'll solve it. No, start with the customer and see how can we assemble different technologies to solve that problem. So moving on. I've been speaking a little bit about these different things. And this is what I really am trying to understand. What is going on in this, world, you know, this whirlwind of things that are happening? What is happening with value creation? And we have you know, a whole new workforce. By 2020, 50% of the workforce will be millennials. I was born in 1985 and less. Gig economy, 50% of the world's, of, of the U.S. workforce supposedly will be, or is predicted to be, uh, what do you say, freelancers, independent uh, people working on their own uh, by 2020 as well. So we also have all types of different things happening with technology. I feel every day I have to put in something new and change that. Where we, I mean, just in the past week, what's been happening with virtual reality, augmented reality, incredible to be seeing what's been, been going on. I don't know if you saw the release by NVIDIA with the holodeck where you can actually go in and co-create co in this one of these virtual worlds. This is where I've been thinking, if you look at virtual worlds and the gamings, how much you can interact with others. This is also an indication of where we might go in the future in terms of actually creating new products. Open source, Bitcoin. Where did Bitcoin and all these cryptocurrencies come from? Open source software. Communities of people from around the world coming together to work together. Today there's a market value of around 140, I'm not quite sure, I haven't checked today, it's, you know, but it's somewhere like 140, 150 billion dollars in these new cryptocurrencies. Do any of you have Ether, by the way? I'm just kind of curious. Anybody know what Ether is? Okay, yeah, a few of you, yeah. We, know, we all know what Bitcoin is, right? Ether is like the next generation. So I just encourage you to actually look into the different cryptocurrencies, blockchains, and what's going on, the fantastic, exciting things that are happening there. Finance, uh, many different things. So we'll be talking a lot about this today. So all of this, if we put, put this into perspective, Economic historians, they look for patterns. And people say, well, you not, history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And if we look for one, touch, one such rhyme, one of the things that economic historians have seen is that you have a, a big innovation. 30 to 40 years later, there's a deep financial crisis. And then coming out of that's an industrial revolution. Where are we now in this you know, stream of, of revolutions. Are we in the third? Are we in the fourth and the fifth? If you look at World Economic Forum, where this slide comes from, it's somewhere, you know, we're, we're already in the middle of the third and the fourth. As a researcher, I say we don't know yet. It's we don't know until we can look back. But looking at what these people are, are yeah, saying, yeah, maybe we are. Maybe this is the third. And what does that mean for value creation? Think about how long have we had firms? How long have we really had firms like we know them today? It's not that long. How was life organized? How did we work? How did we support ourselves prior to the first industrial revolution? Were we living in cities? Did we leave home to go to work? Did we have an employer? No. We were working in small communities, supporting ourselves, living, you know, it was there. You never left, you know, home to go to work. It was all integrated. We really only have fir had firms for a few hundred years. Multinational firms, SEB, Ericsson, and these that came along in 1870s in Sweden. That's when multinationals started. We haven't had those even that long. So you can see the first Industrial Revolution, very much this, this you know, establishment of the firm, then moving to multinational firms, and now the third one, what is this all about? What is all this? Is there, is there some new form 
of business models and value creation that we're seeing in society. If we think about that and we look into this and say, what support do we have for that? We think, well, look at what's happened between 2001 and 2016. This is the top five publicly traded companies. And you can see in 2001, GE, Microsoft, Exxon, Citibank, Walmart, very asset heavy, many of these. 2016, all technology firms. Quite a difference. These are the top most, you know, highly rated. And also another thing that we've seen is the Standard & Poor 500 companies in the U.S. In 1975, I believe it was, I'm not sure of the figures, but it was like 15% of, of the market value of these firms was intangible assets. So in other words, brand or, you know, you can think about patents or culture, organization, networks technology in a way. It wasn't the physical assets. Today, it's gone from 15 to around 87%. There was a study done that was released in 2015, or data up to 2015. It says 87% of, in, of the market value of the S&P 500 firms is actually intangible assets, things that you can't really touch. So we're seeing a change happening here. And we're seeing a lot of these new multinationals coming up out of nowhere. The winner takes all, big platform companies. Just exploding very quickly too even. Many of these didn't even exist uh, just a few years ago. But where you're seeing that they're trying to create their own niche. Trying to create, this is going to be our space. We want to know everything about the customer here. We want to be able to deliver everything, but we're going to be very asset light. We're going to think about being a platform. Because it all comes down to do we need to actually own the resources or we just need to have access to the resources. And this is also, I see, another fundamental shift. It's about you know, getting, having access and not ownership over resources. We're used to very traditional hierarchical firms where we own everything. But if you look at these firms, look at it in terms of the number of employees. It's a similar, different industries looking at kind of similar firms just look at the number of the difference in number of employees. Marriott, 200,000. Airbnb, 5,000. I believe Airbnb's evaluation has actually gone up. This is from uh, January. But then you see a tremendous difference in the number of employees. Now, clearly, this has a lot to do with automation. You can, you can routinize so many tasks. Remember, I was talking about routine tasks. We have so many tasks that are, and you can actually see there's research shown how the routine da tasks, uh, jobs, have really declined and have never come back after the recession. So there is something fundamental changing. And so if, when we're asked, if you were to start again, what would you, how would you actually start? Could one do things differently? And so Airbnb, I think this is a, you know, example of the sharing economy, but the idea is to think about the business model. Who are their customers? And this is also a fundamental difference because their customers, it's called a two-sided platform, right? They actually have customers on one side, those are supplying the houses, but they also have customers on the other side who are renting the houses or renting the properties. So you have to start thinking differently. It's not just about bringing in the resources and you know, taking, being totally in charge and then selling them. It's actually about you know, working with balancing both sides and understanding both sides. And it goes much further and even looks into actually thinking, how can we think about our ecosystem? And here, it becomes all about how can we create you know, access to data, integration, interact with our customers so that we can develop new services. So what we're seeing, this fundamental shift in strategy has to do, we're going very much from a shift where we had a pipeline economy, a traditional linear value chain, where you were in control, you own the resources, and then you spit them out to the customer to moving much more to a platform-based business model. And what we see changing here is where do you get your competitive advantage? In the pipeline model, it was all about economies of scale, supply side economies of scale, creating, producing lots and lots of goods at a very, you know, at a, so you could get down your fixed costs, so you, then you could, you know, sell and make a profit. Supplies, and this created a barrier to entry. But now we're talking about demand side economies of scale. We flip it. It's about creating networks effects and getting more and more users up there. For every transaction you have, the higher value is created. 
So this is why so many platforms are out trying to get a mass, as many people onto the platform, hooked up, interacting through, so they can raise the, the, the value that's created in each transaction to create a demand side economies of scale, which then leads to a barrier to entry. So this is very much building on networks. So I can see, encourage all of you, if you don't know much about the basic principles, go out and, and Google, read, learn. There's lots of good uh, massively open online courses, MOOCs on social networks. There's fantastic videos, TED Talks, etc. Learn about the basic principles of networks. Because we are very much are in this network society and having to, helping to understand is so important. One other thing that's changed quite dramatically is actually this whole aspect of trust. We're seeing the aspect where the first revolution was very much about interpersonal. I had a direct connection with that firm, the person who owned that firm. Moving to multinational, trust becomes, you know, separated from the person, becomes trust in a brand, trust in an institution. And now we're seeing in this third generation, or this third industrial revolution, where it's about enabling trust between strangers. Right? Because in this platform world, you have users on both sides. How do you enable trust? So all for these platforms, that's where they're spending so much time. How can we enable trust? How can we build trust and get rid of frictions so that we can en en reach, enrich and increase our transactions' values? So many things are changing. I'll go through a few more slides. I think this is uh, interesting. What we see many companies today is we think about exploitation where they're trying to say, how can we do what we're already doing better and better, right? We're going to take these technologies, we're going to make the products cheaper, we're going to get them to market faster, uh, we're going to make a little bit more profit, but that is not necessarily, you have to be thinking about what are you actually doing? And this is a difference between management and leadership. For me, management is over here, right? You're doing all the things right. But the question is, re leaders say, are we doing the right things? Right? So you just switch the words, doing the things right, to doing things, doing the right things. And this is where I encourage you, that's why I said to start out as a tourist. Right? Go in and say, what would we do? How would we start over? Well, how would we organize our business? How would we think about competitive advantage, etc.? And this is where you're seeing a lot of new companies challenging this and challenging basic assumptions. So Bill Gates says, banking is essential, but banks are not. Do we need banks? We haven't had a central bank that many years either, only a few hundred. But yet we take it for granted, we're laughing. But yeah, if we think about the whole you know, span of mankind, we haven't had central banks that long. So many people are questioning, do we actually need banks? And maybe we can create other services, such as in fintech. We have a book coming out within the next few months with Rutledge, looking at fintech, which is you know, how we can we use new technology and new services, or new, new technologies to actually enable financial transactions. And many of these are not banks. So this book will be coming out shortly. But this is just one example. How many of you have bought something on Kickstarter or another platform, crowdfunding platform, a few of you? This is, this is also a platform. This is a, another form of a you know, platform business model. This is a platform for innovation. People have ideas, great ideas, but need funding, need market access, need market knowledge. So this is a, you know, go in and see what's being out there. In fact, some companies are even test, testing their products, throwing them out on Kickstarter first before they go to market and say, is there an interest for this part, product? Do people actually want it? But here, the idea th with this is that actually the pace of innovation will even be going more quickly because you can get to market much more quickly. Now, and from anywhere in the world. This is Kung Fury, a film uh, by a group up in Umeo who couldn't receive money from, funding from the bank, put it on Kickstarter, and now has created this successful film. We also have this moving into all, you know, thinking differently. Where can I get my money from? So, for example, in property management, real estate management, real estate development, to seen in Sweden, where you can actually now go and invest in different real estate projects. So these are just some examples. There's a lot going on in crowdfunding, and we talk a lot about in this book, in the book. Another form of crowdfunding is actually crowd equity. Leo Motors said, I'm going to challenge the basic assumptions around cars. Who said cars need four wheels? Why can't we create a car with three wheels? So he put, put out something on Start Engine uh, for his company, and he managed to get in $39 million. People who bought shares in the company. And the whole idea is to create a car that actually will only cost, it's, uh, his target was $6,800. It's about $7,400 for a car, a brand new car. 
He said, this, you know, we have to sh shake up this industry. Let's think about doing things differently. Automobile, automotive industry, in fascinating industry. And I think there's so much, if you want to look at one that's really going through so many different changes, it's very interesting to look at the different examples of how people are challenging basic assumptions. So this is actually coming out on the roads. You can go and pre-purchase your, your three-wheeled car if you like. The reason I show this is, about I talk about the automotive industry, is that there's also another way of thinking about how we can think about industrial production. And this is up here on the right is our second industrial revolution type of firm, right? Very hierarchical firm. You break things down, supply side economies of scale. But what about, can we start thinking differently? Can we create an, an automobile form that is kind of like a Wikipedia? So Local Motors comes along uh, in the US, started by a few people from Harvard Business School, challenging the auto industry. Why can't we do things differently? Why can't we think about flipping the firm? And so I'll just show you a couple pictures. Here is their kind of Wikipedia page for anyone in the world who would like to go in and say, hey, I've got a great idea. Who would like to help me develop this? And they also say, well, hey, let's crowdsource the ideas. So they said, can we create a 3D printed autonomous vehicle? So they threw it out there, got lots of ideas, and now they're continuing to develop this. This is actually already produced. But what's interesting is it's 3D printed, right? And it's autonomous, and they're thinking, how, it's, how is actually, who's designing it? They together with the community. One other thing that's interesting with this is, this Oli, is that because it's 3D printed, in just this type of mini bus, they've gone from 25 to 30,000 parts to only 50. It becomes a lot easier to actually assemble. This is one aspect. What I find even more interesting is where are they being printed? Or where, you know, where are these actually things being constructed? And here again, they challenge an assumption. Why should we go to low-cost low, you know, low labor countries? Can we not produce right in our own hometown? And should we create a factory that's stable? No, why can't we put a factory in a truck? We put 3D printers in a truck, and it can drive around. Here you have a new way of thinking, this point of demand, where you're creating, you know, producing, designing globally, but then you can individualize or localize the product for local conditions and even then produce. This leads to circular economies as well, because they're actually looking with how can we use the products, the resources that we have. Maybe we can take old, old cars and old plastics and grind them up and then put them into our car. So people, again, challenging basic assumptions. We have no idea what the future holds. So moving forward, there's so many things to be talking about here. What I'd like you to do is really challenge, challenge yourselves. What, you know, what, what kind of, what assets do you have? What resources do you have? How, what networks do you have? How can you actually enable them? And think differently in terms of challenging assumptions. Say, okay, out there, what is going on? What are the different scenarios? What if, but what's important is that everyone through the organization is actually thinking about this, opening up, sharing, because those firms, those organizations that think and flat and share knowledge without this power distance and also open up to external so you don't have these barriers because that's where knowledge gets stuck. These are the ones that are more innovative and more successful. So with that, I will, yeah, I'm done. My time's up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please stay. Please stay, Robin. And, uh, Please raise your hands if you have any spontaneous thoughts or questions to Robin. I thought it was very, very interesting. Kind of scary. We don't know anything about the future. It's not new. We always knew that. But uh, uh, one reflection is that uh, we also know, learn about history that sometimes the winner are the late adopters, those yes. who wait and see what's happened and, and take it a little bit easy. And Listening to you, it feels yeah. like you have to try new things all the time. Yeah. I think it's exactly, you have to try, but whether or not you put your resources on is a different thing. I think it's about being very open and trying, testing. Testing at an individual level. That's why I asked, you know, how many, or I could ask how many of you have a 3D printer. Just to start understanding, or a robot, how do these things work? But not necessarily, you know, going in that direction. It's about, it's actually, they say in innovation, you need to delay your decision as late as possible because the market can change. So this is actually delaying the decision, but actually you have to think in scenarios, and that's why it's become so important to have a network with resources that you can access quickly, because then when it, oh, okay, go, then you can, you know, can mobilize resources. Yeah.
So, so what's interesting today, listening to you, is that I mean, for all these new companies, uh, entries are barrier so low. So you have all these new competitors, but when you have an old B and W, as you saw, 200,000 200, employees or whatever it was, yeah. it's pretty tough to change. You know where you make your money. It's yeah. a big challenge. It is a big challenge, and what we've seen is that many people, that the organizations that are successful, uh, researchers have seen that it's those who start little spin-offs. It's very hard to do it within the established organization because you have your established routines, processes, chains of, of, of control, etc. And but you, quite often you have to do it outside because here you can actually start fresh. It's very hard to do it in the old. So this is, is you know, speaking about keeping the exploitation. This is where you exploit, but then this is where you explore, trying something small on the outside. Yeah. And working a lot, uh, thinking about, you know, inter-organizational arrangements, joint ventures, or, or just create, you know, creating some type of partnership to explore together. Think, this is another thing. I think of talking about a basic assumption is we tend to think when a problem comes along, I have to solve it myself or we have to solve it ourselves. But turn that around. The solution's already out there. So go from being a problem solver to a solution finder. Because in that way, it's, it's already out there. And think about how I can use my network to find that solution. Maybe another answer is we were listening to Leif Östling from Scania this morning. He said, you know, even the big organization, they have to change by being using new technology and listen to your customers even more carefully and think about there and, and that's yes. also it has to do with new technology that mm -hmm. makes that possible i guess yes i think that's that's extremely important i think that you're seeing these new organizations that's exactly what they're trying to do understand the customers every behavior why do you think all these you know all these social media sites and these other sites are always trying to get you to interact with them and following you they're getting access to your data because through this data and through analysis of all these data they can actually they move on to predictive or pres and then prescriptive analytics where they can actually you know oh wow it looks like like we should, we, this is a service, there's a pain here that we can solve. So this is uh, exactly putting the customer in, in focus. Okay. Please raise your hands if you have any questions or thoughts. Uh, otherwise, um, finally, Robin, uh, it's a big debate now in the world. How is Europe doing? How is the US doing in the future? And considering all, yeah. all your thoughts about yes. this <laughs> revolution that's going on, who are the winners in the future when it comes to geographic mark different? Uh yeah, that's that's a big question. I, those who will be the winners are the ones clearly who can adapt the fastest, who enable individuals to relearn themselves or reteach themselves. I think that's so important. We have to reinvent ourselves. I'm sorry, I'm, I translate sometimes from Swedish to English. We have to reinvent ourselves continuously. We have to stop thinking linearly. So those countries or those organizations that enable their their population to actually continuously reinvent themselves, these will be the winners because it's if you sit there and think I can I can survive with yesterday's knowledge, it's not going to work. So I think it's all about how do we enable that through through all different types of things. Maybe it's the co-working hubs, it's small sites, it's giving free access to Wi-Fi overall. It's there's many different ways. But I think this So what is are you saying? One. You don't see in a pattern that uh, Swedish companies has come far here and Japanese are bad or opposite. I think what you see around. is it's people companies are, are good at different things. So for example, Japan, yes, in terms of robotics. Why? Well, Japan has a goal of being the world's number one in robotics. So I think it, it, it depends on, you know, look at the US. You've got these gigantic platform companies. In China, you've got them also coming along with Tencent and Alibaba. I just read yesterday, Alibaba is now uh, going to be invest, start, starting up 10 different R&D centers around the world. So it's, it's it, yeah, it it, I think it's, it's, it's a world of heterogeneity where you see many different winners in different areas, but with the future, well, again, we have no idea. Extremely interesting. Thanks. Thank you very much for coming Thank you. Here. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. And this Thanks. is a little gift. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.